Uh, hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, so today we've had uh, Martin back for his final presentation on everything to do with the research he's been doing up in Yorkshire, but not just in Yorkshire, in all over Britain. Um, and we we dove, we 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 went into uh, we revisited some of the um, the drama between Michael and the devil within the landscape. Um, did the ancient people in Britain dis discover the golden ratio um, before the Greeks or separate to the Greeks? What's going on there? Yeah, we we covered quite a lot of things, didn't we? Um, uh, mm. Gone over some of the stuff we did in some of the previous episodes uh, and then eventually brought it all back down to, to, to Thornborough again and the Henges there and uh, Marty's idea for a, for a date for the construction. And he's got some damn good reasons why he thinks that. But... Um, uh, yeah, it's yeah. a shame the series has come to an end, but um, hopefully Martin will come back at some point if he's got any other little tidbits for us to to uh, yeah. feast on. Um, yeah. And we've got some more um, star map magic, hopefully next week. We're welcoming, welcoming, welcoming back Steve Willits uh, um, to cover uh, his South East Wales star map, um, which we're both excited for as well. So we hope you enjoy Martin's contribution. And, um, yeah. Enjoy. Before we start, just quickly, here are some AI-generated art pieces, which were done for Martin's work especially. Um, and if you're interested in anything like this done for yourself, uh, contact Peter, and he can refer you to Troy, who does this stuff. Thanks. Welcome back, Martin. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. That's all right. We are here for your final instalment of the Yorkshire uh, Starmac Megalithic Complex uh, and any other verbs, uh, adjectives I need to put on there. Um, massive megastructure. I mean, what else can we call it? Lines, alignments, devils. Yeah, devils. St. Michael. St. Michael, Michael. Oh, God, yeah, I missed him out. Uh, we get to South America and Asia today. Oh, fantastic! Uh, only very briefly. It's just just a warm up from spending so much time in Yorkshire, is that? Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, it's great. We're going to well, have loads of fun. Everyone needs a holiday, don't they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, fire away whenever you're ready. Really looking right. forward to it. We've had a bit of a gap between these. Right. So, picture on the front there, um, you may recognise it's uh, Mont Saint Michael in uh, northern France. Uh, and you'll see why there's a picture of it in a few slides. It's just yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It's quite impressive, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it is. Uh, so, just quickly the story so far. So, we started by talking about the Thornborough Henges and the Devil's Arrows, and we got on to the Rootstone Monolith. So, the Rootstone Monolith is the largest standing stone in Britain, and two of the Devil's Arrows, the two that are furthest away in that picture, are the second and third largest. So, the one that guy is... Uh, dwarfed by, isn't one of the largest. <laughs> uh, we then uh, started from the basis that it's uh, almost commonly accepted that the devil, uh, that sorry, the Thornborough Henges may reflect uh, Orion, the stars of Orion's belt on the uh, um, on the ground. Uh, and I spent some time trying to extend that, uh, what you might call it star map, a small star map it was, uh, and finished up with this. So these are the Thornborough Henges. Down here we have the Devil's Arrows that are the Pleiades. Uh, and up here we have Canabarn Henge, which is Aldebaran. And the accuracy of that is to within 100 feet on uh, each of them. Uh, we looked at the odds of that, and they're enormous. So <laughs> it's not likely to happen randomly. No. So I'm pretty confident that that was deliberate. Um, and if you remember, this this particular picture of the uh, the Pleiades and the Devil's Arrows had extended the stars a little bit 
just so that you could see that they were there because when I first showed it, you couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> right, so that was episode one. Episode two, we then want, went on to say, well, why is it this shape on the ground? That is a funny shape. Why not have it orientated north, south or east, west? Uh, so the first, well, wasn't actually the first thing, but the first significant thing we looked at uh, was that this particular line here and this angle measured from north represents the furthest south setting of Alderburn. So Canabine is Alderburn, and this line marks out the furthest south setting of it. And that happened in 9600 BC. And here you can see Alderburn rising. So here's the horizon along where the uh, angular measurement is. And you can see that that is 151. And you can see that up here, 150.96. And it's just above the horizon, mm -hmm. which obviously it would need to be above the horizon uh, for them to be able to see it. Uh, yes, the, yes. Month, the, month, the months and the days are totally irrelevant here because the stars rise at the same point on the horizon throughout the year and only drift very slowly. Uh, you'll have heard that precession is one degree every 72 years. Uh, the movement along the horizon isn't quite like that because it's uh, a sort of sine wave. Yes. Uh, yeah. So some, sometimes it's fast, but at the end it's quite slow. So that particular date was the date of the catastrophic end of the Ice Age. Uh, so it was the Younger Dryas period, and we saw at that point uh, a warming of 10 degrees uh, in a very short period of time. At the start of it, they thought, um, when they first found out about it, they thought that the period was about 20 years. That period has uh, shrunk every time I've read about it, uh, and people are now talking, saying it's possible that the temperature rise occurred in a year. Now, if you compare oh. that with what we've seen, one and a half degrees in nearly 200 years, uh, you can see that something was going on. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. Um, 9,600 BC is also Plato, uh, Plato's date for the end of Atlantis in Timaeus. Uh, and uh, for those that doubt Plato, he goes to great lengths in those uh, two um, writings to say that he's telling a true story. Uh, it's at least it's in there at least four times. Um. Now, there are a number of legends about something happening in the sky and uh, causing catastrophes on the Earth. So, as it says here, the Dakota Sioux have the legend of Old Baron falling to Earth after killing the serpent, after killing the serpents, so a battle in the sky, um, and something fell, and that created the Mississippi River. Now, at this time... Uh, 9600 BC with that warming we got the what's called meltwater pul pulse 1b sounds very technical but at the end of the ice age uh, you had a num uh, continuous rise in sea level really but there were two or three big events where you got um, uh, tens or twenties or thirties of feet within a very few years uh, and Meltwater Pulse 1B was one of the biggest. Mm. There's also a legend that um, the, when the flood was caused, God took uh, two of the Pleiades uh, and used those to create the flood. Mm. So, interesting. All, all interesting stories. Yeah. Might be nothing in them at all, but <laughs> one tends to think that there might be as well. Mm -hmm. Right, so the next thing we looked at was the Ripon Cathedral hypothesis. So remember, we're still talking about this line. Yeah. Uh, and this is the halfway point of the line, spot on the halfway point. Uh, you'll notice there's another hinge on the line, by the way, mm -hmm. and that is 
exactly on the line. The line that line goes through the edges of the hinge, <laughs> uh, but it's not in the middle, and we'll come to why later on. Um, now, I, I didn't know what to make of this line at all. I struggled with it for ages. Uh, and eventually I found that if I took a right angle to it, that would pick out the summer solstice sunrise. <laughs> uh, and then if I come back from there, just follow it back, it comes to Ripon Cathedral and actually passes about where that figure is there. So it comes across there. Yeah. Um, you'll also recall that the the legend of uh, the way that uh, the devil's arrows were formed or built talks about the devil standing on How Hill, and How Hill is is down here. So, just briefly update you with the legend because it, it this is relevant to what we're about to talk about. So, yeah. If, if you remember, uh, this was supposedly in the very early days of Christianity and uh, the priests, or the Christian priests or missionaries, went to see the king uh, to talk about the kingdom becoming Christian. Uh, and the Druids came and they had a big argument. Uh, and halfway through the argument, this very old wizened Druid appeared and walked over the hill. Uh, and he was a very convincing speaker with very convincing arguments, uh, and the discussion was going the Druid's way. Uh, and then one of the missionaries noticed that the devil, and you can see it here, his feet were sinking into the ground, and the ground was bubbling and hot. Uh, and he immediately assumed it was the devil, and he shouted something like, get behind me, Satan, which maddened the devil, and he picked up the stones and threw them towards uh, Albra, and they actually fell just short. Uh, I always say, if you're ever in a place where the devil wants to throw stones at you, stand still, he's likely to miss. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> So, this is How Hill, and there's a building on it, which I thought was relatively modern, so I had nothing to do with uh, what we are interested in. Uh, but you may remember that this building was built on the site of a previous building, which was St. Michael's Chapel. Hmm. Now, why was there a St. Michael's Chapel there? Is the, is the question. So the legends are that St. Michael battled the devil and killed the devil, and this is from Revelation, actually, so I suppose it's a prophecy. Uh, and this is a, a Middle Eastern picture of St. Michael here killing the devil. So it may be that the uh, uh, early Christians knew about the stories about the devil's arrows and the thorn branches and mm. just wanted their own legend to overcome that but if we look at this we found these stars that look very similar uh, to the uh, High Hades which uh, Aldebaran is one of them and we already have Aldebaran uh, represented by Canaban so could this be some way of drawing our attention to that Mm. Um, and I think there is quite a reasonable possibility of that. So, so that's the legend. Mm -hmm. We then talked about the location being special, and it is um, Thornbrenges, or the Devil's Arrows, actually, a 10% of the Earth's circumference from the North Pole. They're at 54 degrees, which doesn't sound very significant, but it's 60% of the way from the uh, equator to the North Pole. Mm. Uh, there are some interesting astronomical alignments there that you would only get at that latitude. And if anyone's interested in what they are, uh, take a look at, I think it was episode two. Um and then we went on to talk about the Rudstone monolith, which we saw in the previous slide. 
uh, the biggest standing stone in Britain uh, and how that might have some sort of significance to represent the, the people that at that time knew about procession and had knowledge of the size and shape of the solar system. Uh, right, so episode three, we then went on to all the devil's works. And if you remember this picture, these are all the devil sites I've found. I've not put natural ones in here, by the way. So things like, um, oh, there's a famous valley somewhere in the Downs. That's not in. You'll notice, yeah. though. Sorry, go on, Pete. No, no, no. I was just, uh, just uh, interested. Uh, um, be probably worth maybe looking at them in future, though, and and just seeing if there is anything else there where the where the name or the yes, um, yeah, 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 it or, would, or an it interesting would... rock outcrop or something like that, which could act yes. as a marker. Yes, it would mm. indeed. Yeah. But I can now, see why you have to draw the line at some point. As well. <laughs> A lot of data points, isn't it? <laughs> there is. So you'll yeah. notice that most of them are down in this area and down here. Mm. There aren't many at all. So we can draw this line across here. And people who know about English history might know what that line is. It's the line that meant, uh, marked the uh, division of the Danelo to the Saxon room ruled lands of the uh, south. Uh, now, not everyone will know what the Danelo was. So when the Vikings started invading England, uh, they came uh, as raiders, really, and lots mm. of plunder and rape and all the rest of it that they're, uh, people are familiar with. Somewhere about nine, uh, sorry, 870, I can't remember the exact date, but it, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, they came in force, and it was called, I think, the Grand Army or the Great Army or something. They landed in Yorkshire, conquered Yorkshire, and then they moved down to Norfolk. Mm -hmm. uh, and... <clears throat> They conquered the kingdom that was around Norfolk and then went on and conquered Mercia, which was in the middle here. Uh, and that only left Wessex. Now, Wessex roughly around here. Uh, and you'll have heard of the King of Wessex because it's King Alfred, the only <laughs> English monarch to be called the Great. Uh, they almost beat Alfred as well, because on uh, New Year's Day uh, one year, they attacked and he was probably suffering from a hangover, I suspect, you know, you know what Brits are like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and he beat them. It was and... in Somerset, so it was probably scrubby cider. <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and Alfred survived by running away effectively and he ran away to the Somerset Levels which uh, are an area of marshland uh, and he sheltered with this old woman um, and that's where the story of him burning the cakes come from so she left him, she was baking bread so she left him to look after the bread uh, and he let them burn. <laughs> uh, <coughs> she wasn't impressed. Anyway, he came out of hiding and there was a huge battle. Uh, I can't remember the name of the battle now, but he won it. Uh, and eventually the, uh, he set that they settled with the Danes on this line. Uh, and so the Danes ruled north of the line and... Alfred ruled south. Now it's interesting because, sorry, sorry to go on about that. But, uh, it's interesting because the Danes didn't have uh, a figure that was synonymous with uh, the devil. So I suspect that what we're seeing here are the devil sites that had made the biggest impact on the people. Uh, and the name just continued, whereas all the others were obliterated. Well, it could be under the name 
maybe Grimm or or even Odin or Woden or yeah, it could be actually. Yeah, I mean, I know we get we obviously get those Saxon versions in England as well. We get yeah. we get the, the um like Woden for instance rather than Odin, but it'd be it'd be interesting if there may be none named after other other. Hmm. Might, be, might be worth having a look at that, yeah. actually. I, mean, yeah. I might add that to my list, but I can't guarantee you when I'll get to it. No, no, no. Well, keep, it's good to just uh, be aware of these things, isn't it? Um, you never know what will catch your eye. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, we've got one here, which is the Druid Stone, and it's the Devil something or it's fallen off the edge of the picture, so I can't <laughs> tell you what. <laughs> So there are a few that are not quite devil, and we'll come to another one, actually, in a slide or two. Um, if you remember, this really began when I uh, started. I'd, I'd reached a point that I didn't know where to continue, and uh, I'll just briefly mention my three o'clock in the morning voices, uh, which kept telling me to look south, and I kept... I got into an argument, really, and uh, not that I'm an argumentative soul, you know that. Um, and uh, I've looked south, no, I've looked south. So eventually, if you remember, I drew a line from the Devil's Arrows due south, uh, and it passes about uh, 200 feet to the uh, east of this site, and <laughs> this site is the uh, Devil's Coit, uh, near Oxford, it's at Whitney. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the most famous sites in England. So I thought, oh, maybe there is something to this. <laughs> and so that got me interested in Devil's Sight. Uh, and then I looked around, and Devil, Devil's Coit is actually quite uh, a common name. All, all of these are called Devil's Coit in some manner or other. This one is uh, Cromlech, uh, is a pile of stones, effectively. Um, mm. Yeah, um, this this is due due east, uh, sorry, due west of this one, um, and it's in Pembroke, and all of these three are in Pembroke. Nice. Uh, so we took we talked about those last time, anyway, but uh, just just rem reminding you. Now, interestingly, this one, this one, and this one are all near St. Michael's churches. Mm. We also then went down to Cornwall, uh, and here we have uh, the Devil's Quite in Cornwall, and obviously it was Dolman at some point, but the uh, only the capstone is left. Mm. Uh, and then we also found the Devil's Tor, um, which uh, Peter is familiar with, um, on Dartmoor. Uh, and this stone is called uh, Bear Down Man and is just north of the Devil's Tor. Um, and I know from discussions that it's much bigger than it looks. Yeah. Uh, we also covered the Devil's Stone at Sheba. Uh, this is, they have a ceremony every year, I think it's the 5th of November, where they turn it over to keep the Devil at bay uh, for another year. Now, the church at Sheba is St. Michael's. So, we've got something building up here in terms of churches. But, if you remember, we built this triangle then, so this was the north-south line. Mm. This was the east-west line. This was the line of the uh, summer solstice, sorry, the winter solstice from the Devil's Arrows. This was the sight line, this black one, uh, was the sight line of the equinox sunset from Whitney. <clears throat> and there is a, a line joining these, but you can't see them. And then there's a north-south line here down to the Devil's Coit in Cornwall. Mm. This, this line here is the uh, <coughs> sunset on Samhain. Um, <laughs> so that all looks pretty much designed to me. Yeah. 
this is more detail of Pembroke, so and you can see the lines coming in here. So this is the one that goes across to uh, Oxford. This is the north-south line I talked about, finishing at Points Wood, and there's another one there. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, the one up to the Devil's Arrows. <coughs> we then went on to talk about um, what I thought when I first started this was a fictitious and uh, amusing tale of a Devil's Line, which would reflect the St Michael's Line. So the St Michael's Line is the most famous ley line in Britain, and this is where it goes. But there is a devil's similar line. So if you look at this, we're going through quite a lot of devil sites mm. very near to them. Now, when we were talking about that, Peter mentioned Hellstone, which never struck me as a devil's site. But when you think about it, it's absolutely obviously a devil's <laughs> site. So that leads us on to the new stuff. Now, let me just... Here. That's it. What have we got here? You remember this? <laughs> no. Right, enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> they look like they're having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> right, so when we talked about this, you mentioned Hellstone and the Flower Festival on May the 8th in Hellstone. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it also has a song which I thought was amusing. <laughs> so, that song is uh, the, the flower dance, um, uh, which was recorded in the 1970s by the Rastrick and Brighouse uh, uh, Brass Band. Is that and what you just treated us to? Is that's it? what I've treated mm -hmm. you to. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that, believe it or not, got to number two in the charts. <laughs> so I just, I just thought that was amusing. <laughs> <laughs> so do they, use, do they use this song on Flora Day? Uh, apparently so. Yeah. A version of it, obviously. Yeah, yeah it'd be a version of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the town in Helston, uh, that's what we've just said, is has a flower day on the 8th of May each year. St Michael's Day uh, is the 8th of May, and Helston Church is St Michael's. Now, there is a legend that goes with this. Many years ago, a fiery dragon appeared and dropped a large stone on an area known as the Angel Yard. Uh, and further on, there's um, an, another piece from this. So the devil was carrying the stone that sealed Hell's mouth when he met St. Michael and dropped the stone on Hellstone. Well, hmm. interesting, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> May the 8th is a celebration of maybe a meteor falling on Hellstone. Absolutely. Obviously. Or something Obviously. in the area. Or at yeah. least a, a memory of it that's somehow translated through. I mean, it's just... I'm also interested about St. Michael um, being celebrated on the 8th of May. I found out recently that he's associated with the constellation of Taurus, which would, yes. be, would yeah. be in between the 20th of April and the 20th of May, if you can... Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. 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 Uh, Old Baron is supposed to be St. Michael's star. Mm. So there's, there seems to be lots of intertwining threads in there in the stuff I've been doing that I never realised before this year that we're even there. But you know, every everything you turn over now, you seem to find something that's looped in and tied in. Mm -hmm. Right. Hellstone and the Devil's Line. If you remember, I, I mentioned that um, it was difficult getting the exact line because it was sort of uh, the, the least errors between the sides. <coughs> now, I, I had to move it very slightly 
uh, to take in Hellstone, but then when I checked the line, it finished up as possibly more accurate. So it looks as though Hellstone is on that line. Mm. Right, so is it possible that we had a, um, some sort of impact at Hellstone or near it uh, on the 8th of May? Uh, and was that associated with St. Michael and the Devil by legend? Now, we've already seen that the Oaks Complex has these associations. So we've got St. Michael up there, we've got the Devil's Arrows. Um, and through that complex web of uh, lines, there is a connection between Yorkshire and the, the Devil's Line down here. So could it be the, the period that Canaban Henge is drawing us to, the catastrophic end of the Younger Dryas, is when this happened. So that got me looking at uh, meteor showers in 9,600 uh, BC and when they were. Now, if you use uh, uh, Stellarium at all, uh, you can turn on meteor showers so you can see where the uh, radiant point of the uh, meteor shower is. The radiant point yeah. is where they all, all appear to appear from. Um, and it will only show you when those uh, that uh, meteor shower, when the meteor showers are active. So if I look at May the 8th, I see that I get the Northern Taurids, the Southern Taurids, can't read that one, the Orionoids, uh, the Geminids. So all of these are the meteor showers that we get uh, at the end of October. So yeah. if, you're, if you think that this is uh, half away in the year, away from where uh, it is now, and that uh, 9600 BC is roughly half the great year away that would explain why all, all these are active on that date so <clears throat> very circumstantial but could, could something have happened at that period of history mm. I don't suppose we'll ever know but it's interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah Right, so just to move on from there, then, the Devil's Line. So um, you may know uh, Peter Benning. Sorry, the... sorry, can I interrupt you, Mike? Yeah. I've just got to give me two minutes. All right, okay. Oh, great. I've just got to boot the dog out. And... <laughs> there we go. Uh, right, so on the um, Brothers of the Serpent uh, Discord uh, piece, uh, there's a guy called Ben who's quite speculation, who you'll know about. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He suggested trying to draw uh, a great circle from that line. Um, and... I'm never convinced by these great circle things. Uh, he's he's quite keen because he's into NazgaSolution.com and all that sort of thing. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know whether you've come across that, but uh, I did say I'd drop his name and I'd drop the name of the site. So. Yeah, yeah. No, great. <laughs> um, it, it's a sort of thing I've never really dived into, but the Nazca lines yeah. just them, in themselves are absolutely... Yeah, fascinating. Fascinating sort of topic, and and I think anyone who tried to have a go at any of that is is um, is a bit of a you've hero, to, really. And yeah, uh, I think you've got to be brave. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you can see it drawn out here, uh, and I did find two interesting places. It went quite near, but I think it is a lesson in caution. So you, just because it goes near, you can't necessarily say that they're related. So the Ataka anyway, it's down here. <laughs> um, yeah, um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it goes very close, actually. So it's only 14 miles away, which in uh, a 25,000 mile long uh, circle is absolutely mm. nothing. 
Um, so do we think that maybe there's a relationship to the devil with uh, this particular monument? And he looks then, a lot like the Sir Harris giant, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah. And then further around the world, there's the giant Buddha at Lishan. Uh, that's a bit further away, but it's only 76 miles, so it's percentage-wise, it's not very far off. So we've got two big figures. Uh, now, if there weren't figures, I'd ignore them, but, you know, it's just a little bit suggestive. As I say, a lessening caution. You can believe it if you wish. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I want to go back to How Hill. So we did talk about it being uh, a survey datum point for the build. Uh, and this is a picture drawn by uh, one, one of the guys on the Discord. What's oh, is that, Troy's, is... is it? Yeah, yeah. So this is I, lo I love that one. Do you know what? It's so nice to see uh, ancient people, one, not depicted naked and butt flat. Yes, yeah. And yeah. two, with the actual tools of their trade, which they would have yeah. needed in order to achieve these things. Yes. Yeah. You know, but... they, I mean, you, anyone that had not looked at what we've looked at over this. Uh, would never think that they must have had stuff like this, but they must have done. They must I have mean, done, yes. absolutely. You can't absolutely. build stuff like this without knowing what the level is and yeah. you know what the height is and what the design is. It's impossible. Mm. <laughs> so, so on the top of Howe Hill, we've already mentioned this, there was a chapel dedicated to St. Michael and uh, the Archangel. Uh and the chapel was called St. Michael de Mons. Now, the picture I showed you at the beginning is called uh, Mont St. Michael. Mont Saint Michel. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 li you live nearer to the French. Uh, <laughs> your accent is better. That's how it works. Is it? <laughs> Can't wait to hear your Swedish accent. <laughs> <laughs> So that got me interested in St. Michael and the Devil. Uh, so there are a number of legends of St. Michael's battle with the devil. So the French legend um, says that the battle uh, started at a place called Mont Dol and the devil was killed at Mont St. Michael. So that's Mont St. Michael. This is Mont Dol. It's a very uh, pretty little place. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it. It has, has its own cathedral now. Oh, wow. Um, it's a very, it's, it's um, not much of a mountain, is it? Um, no, yeah. not, much, not much of a mountain. <laughs> I was going to say, no, northern France isn't um, like m massively hilly. Um, yeah. I, I suspect that's the biggest hill for about 100 miles around. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I, oh and are you about to tell me that that obelisk is um, on on it? Yeah, it's just just about uh, where this photograph had been taken from. I think. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> so it's down here somewhere. Mm. Uh, so that's actually, it's enormous, and it isn't even the biggest one in, uh, is it Normandy or is it Britain? Uh, it would be Britain, wouldn't it? Be Brittany, won't it? Um, there's also a devil's seat on this hill. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, okay, interesting. Yeah, and this is the cathedral. You'll notice that um, this tower seems a bit odd. Yeah, yeah. So, the legend says uh, that the devil, from sitting on his seat, which we've seen the seat was watching St. Samson build the cathedral at Dol de Bretin. Mm -hmm. um, was that a better pronunciation? No, not quite. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Really. So he got annoyed and he picked up a rock and he threw it uh, and it hit the uh, Northern Tower and destroyed the top of the Northern Tower, which is why you don't have a complete mm. top on the no, I was going to say, is that Samson's Cathedral? Because uh, yes, Samson's fascinating. He's uh, he's uh, obviously associated with Arthur as well, and uh, loads of the the saints and the and the knights as well. 
Did Very he interesting. Go, did he go across in the first when when they first went across to uh, to France to beat the Romans? Um, no, he would have been a bit late. I mean, it it, it gets all a bit confusing because each time there's some sort of movement over it almost gets placed as the the first mig migration um, yeah, right. um so you can take back that movement into Brittany right back to like 383 with magnus maximus but yeah, then as yeah. there's waves of saints backwards and forwards people will say oh this was them bringing christianity over each time but you think well hold on it's already been there for 100 years yeah you know what's what's going on but um but he is definitely uh, Samson is a really fascinating character in in history and uh, mythology, I would say as well. Um, so anyway, he had this uh, uh, this do with the devil, the Saint Samson. Uh, the stone obviously didn't do a tremendous amount of damage and finished up uh, in the field, making that uh, an arm stone that we saw. Uh, but it's a pretty familiar story, isn't it? I mean, we've now seen yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen it twice in Yorkshire and once here. So, so there's a very similar site to uh, uh, Mont St. Michael in Cornwall, which is St. Michael's Mount. Uh, St. Michael's Mount is at the bottom of the St. Michael Ley Line, interestingly. Now, I've never been to St. Michael's Mount. I did not almost get there once. So I was going with Deirdre, and we were going across this causeway, and she was pregnant at the time, and she slipped uh, and twisted her ankles. So oh, no. no. <laughs> but I'd have loved to have gone there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, a lovely place. I've nearly been as well. <laughs> <laughs> Come on then, your yeah, story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I can't remember. I was so young, but I remember. I remember. Yeah, right. I remember the name and everything. So, all right. So, in the English legend uh, of the Devil and Saint Michael, uh, the Devil was killed at Dragon Hill in Uffington. So, this is the Uffington White Horse, which is along here, and this is Dragon Hill here. Dragon Hill absolutely fascinates me. It's it's um it's sort of left out a lot. People will photograph the horse a lot and photograph yes, the yeah. um the hill fort that's just above it with it, but um it's it's crazy because it's sort of like this this outjutting hill opposite, but it looks yeah. like it's been leveled. Yes, it's, like that someone's just taken can, the top off it in a flat. You, it's an incredible piece of engineering. It. That's right. You can just about see it on this yeah. picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I, that's the bit I really want to go and look at when I when I go yeah. there. When I when I first came across this legend, I thought, well, Dragon Hill, it's obviously just a bit tacked on to the side. But yeah, the more yeah. I it, the more interesting it is. No, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. So this is interesting though. So if I draw a line from Mont St. Michael to the centre of Henge at Thornborough, it's 0.2 degrees off due north, which gives me an error of two miles at Thornborough. Mm. Uh, and it's 385 miles long. Now, how hill is even nearer to the line than uh, uh, Thornborough Henge? So maybe going from Mont St. Michael, uh, to St Michael's Chapel on Howe Hill was what they were aiming to do. Dragon Hill is one, one and a third miles from the line. Okay. Now, if I draw a line from Mount St Michael to St Michael's Mount, right, I mm -hmm. get a triangle, a right angle triangle. <laughs> This is at right angles. That goes to the devil's arrows, but maybe it's just not quite accurate enough to uh, to be shown at how hill. Mm. So, so a perfect right angle would be thirty one point three three degrees, 
and you can see it's 30.59. So it gives an error of 4.9 miles at the devil's arrows. And the line length is 325 miles long, and the error is 1.5 miles. Now, I just couldn't understand that when I first found out. Mm. <laughs> and I still yeah. can't actually. What does it mean? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to bring in some um, more myth as well? Uh, and the story at St. Michael's Mount is King Arthur killing a giant. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't take much to think that St. Michael killing the devil can turn into King Arthur killing a giant. Yeah. yeah. And um, in fact, is, isn't there something about, um, what's his name, the uh, Brutus? Uh, Brutus's friend killing a giant. Right? Yeah, Corinius is. Yeah, Corinius yeah. fought the giant. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and there's much debate about where that happened. St Michael's Mount is one of the places where. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's quite that. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's quite So, as I said a couple of slides before, it's all getting very convoluted and entangled. Mm. Anyway, is it possible that these were aimed at How Hill and there's some deep significance in How Hill and St Michael's Mount and St Michael's Mountain or whatever hmm. that is in French? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the St Michael bit. Uh, we talked about churches and how they seem to be related to St Michael. Uh, or the ones near the devil site seem to be, uh, and a bit of a bit more digging on that. And there are three names that have churches that keep reappearing. So it's Saint Michael, possibly with all angels and old saints, all angels or all 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 saints, and Saint Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, so some examples of this. So. Uh, this is at the Devil's Arrows, so you can see here there's an Old Saints Church there, St Mary's there, St Michael mm -hmm. and All Angels there. Uh, of the others, um, the Grace Church is one of these new ones that's popped up. Uh, and there are a few others, but these are, you know, they're pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, this is Thornborough. So St Mary's, St Michael, St Michael, St Mary, St Mary. Mm. Uh, obviously, yeah. the Methodist Church is very new. Oh, well, yeah. in comparative terms, very new. Uh, and so there's only one that's not in that group. Mm. And then if we go to uh, Rudstone, the church there is All Saints. And one of the local villages has a St. Michael's church, the nearest local village, actually. I've also, uh, I've noticed some St. Michael's churches are dedicated to St. Michael's and all angels as well. Yes, yeah. Quite obviously. Yeah. Um, well, the, le the legend of the battle, or the story in the uh, uh, in Revelation, is that it's St. Michael and uh, his army. Which... Host, yeah. Yes, his host. So I think that's possibly why. Mm. So right. now we've seen the other sites. These were all the ones on that other slide, but there are more of them. I mean, it's just. Uh... So well, you're, you're not alone because Hugh Evans definitely reckons there's Michael and Mary churches are deeply related to his. I am. Um, his zodiac in North Wales as well. So. Oh right, okay. Well, you might want to give him this next bit then. So, I what I wanted to do was a statistic, that statistical analysis. Try saying that without your teeth. In. <laughs> 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 but I needed a database of churches, and it's amazing how difficult it is to get a decent one actually. Mm. But eventually. Eventually, I uh, e emailed the Church of England admin office and they wrote back and said, well, there's something on the internet. And they gave me the, a link to it. I'd already found it, actually, and rejected it because I thought it was rubbish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the quality of the data wasn't good. Let's so it looks like certain counties are very well covered and others yes. aren't. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. It's not just that, but the data within it needs a lot of cleaning up. Oh, it? okay, right. I must have spent a couple of days on it. Uh, but I'm retired, so I can afford to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, in England, uh, there are about 45,000 churches. Uh, and just a quick look at Welsh churches, and it looks as though the naming patterns are very similar to the English ones. If you look at the Scottish ones, they're a lot different. And that's probably right. because they had the Kirk in Scotland, didn't they? Rather than, the, you know, the Church of England was a bit Catholic for the, for the Scots, I think. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I would expect something different in Wales as well. But then again... Even in the West Country, there was, you know, more of a lean towards Methodism and stuff like that as well. Yeah, so, yes, that's true, yeah. But, but I that, would that, also that, expect to see trends across the entire island that would yeah. crop up uh, yeah, just because yeah. of the... I mean, anything that's Methodist, I've rejected from the analysis. Anyway, yes, yeah. Because okay. it would obviously... You're looking for it, ancient sites, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for ancient sites, yeah. yeah. So the the data the database I got was uh, is about twelve thousand five hundred in it. So it's a pretty good representation of the forty five thousand. Uh, but quite a lot of those were merged, you know, as, as the Church of England has shrunk, they've merged um, parishes. Mm. So it's difficult to make head and a tail from the uh, uh, merged ones. So I ruled those ruled those out, and I got left with about nine thousand. I then tried to map them, and this is the best I could do. Actually, it came out quite well, considering the quality of the data. <laughs> I then wanted to analyse them, so I had a close look at my devil sites, and uh, what I did with the devil sites was I ruled out the Scottish ones, because obviously, just looking around them, it's obvious that the naming conventions in Scotland were somewhat different from England. And I also ruled out the very remote sites from the list, the ones right in the middle of the moor. So Bear Down Man, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the closest church is going to be quite yeah. far away. Yeah. Yeah. That left me with 31 sites. So then I wanted to analyse those sites. So I wanted to give them each a score. So I looked at the for the ne three nearest churches to each one, and I scored them. So if uh, if the nearest, I scored them depending on whether they were a Saint Michael, a Saint Mary, or an Old Saints. Uh, and if if it was any one of those three, the nearest church, it got a score of six. Um, if it was the second nearest, it got a three, and if it was the furthest, it got a one. Now, so you could have a maximum score for any site of ten. Right, okay. Right. 31 sites gave me a score of 133. So I then used the list of churches I had to do 300 random samples, and it did give a very significant result. So the average score of those 300 samples was 90. Mm -hmm. So the probability is, so assuming this is a normal distribution, if you know anything about statistics, if you don't, just follow the, the figures, um, that the uh, probability of this being exceptional so the sites aren't chosen site names aren't chosen at random around mm. uh devil sites is 99.3 percent so to anyone that understands the normal distribution that's higher than two standard deviations it's nearly three standard deviations so this is particular graph shows a profile of all the churches uh, so the most common ones are obviously in the middle so you'd have a stack of St Michael's and St Mary's totaling up there so if you totaled up the number of St Michael's churches mm. you total somewhere around there <coughs> the devil's sites my score put it right out here so the probability is pretty enormous that um, they are purposely named for this reason because they're near one of those sites. Right. 
So we can say with a high degree of uh, confidence that some church dedications are preferred near uh, uh, devil's sites and those that are preferred are St. Michael, St. Mary, all angels and all saints. Um, we should remember that there was certainly a thing in the uh, uh, Christian religion throughout Europe, I think, uh, but certainly in England, of uh, early Christians uh, destroying sites uh, mm. that were pre-Christian uh, or taking over pre-Christian sites and using them for their own purposes. So it may not be that surprising that that uh, result comes out. But I thought I thought it was pretty interesting, nonetheless. Yeah. It tells you something about the mindset of those people. And it also tells you, I think, something about the continuity of the names of these sites. I think continuity is the key word. Um, yeah. Certainly what I'm thinking, that there is definitely a greater continuity and understanding of what the Neolithic people were up to up until much more recent periods of history yeah. than we tend to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that. I mean, I'm not sure where we lost it, but uh, I suspect, for instance, that uh, the early Britons, and uh, that means probably the Welsh, had mm -hmm. a reasonable understanding of it. Yeah, it certainly yeah. seems to be the case from the from the stories that you can directly yeah. link to yeah. geographical places and <clears throat> uh, and if you think about these church namings, uh, sorry, I flipped over too quickly. Uh, if you think about these church namings, uh, you'd think that something was going on. Certainly, to I don't know, twelve hundred, fourteen hundred, maybe. The and other then... possibility is that it's secret and that it's not been lost at all and this is the well, yes, yeah, the actions yeah. of, of of people who remain in hiding for some reason or another yeah yeah, yeah i wouldn't um i mean all you have to do is think of the masons we know about absolutely the masons. How yeah, many i don't think it's outrageous at all how many of them do we know about mm. we don't know a lot do we mm. no. we right more on henges. So, um, Britain is the land of henges. So, if you remember, previously we talked about these are the locations of standing stones throughout uh, Europe. This is the locations of henges. Why is Britain different from France? Mm. <laughs> I'll put mm. on that. I just, just thought that was interesting. That no, is, I definitely. think it's really interesting, especially considering what you find in Brittany with, yeah. you know, stone rows, circles, yeah, big right. standing yeah. stones, yeah. the burial yeah. chambers, it's all there. Why not the henges? Yeah. And even you've got these sites in sort of Germany and uh, Switzerland and stuff. Even there, they have a very different feel to them. Yes, there, is, they, there is certainly similarities, don't get me wrong. But... Yeah, the design does look different. So mm. you see, you see something from uh, I don't know uh, northern Germany, and you think, well, it it is a hinge, but but <laughs> not, yeah, it's, it's not something... as we know it. <laughs> no, no. So this there was, I mean, I don't know whether this was a fashion thing or there was mm. some reason for it or what, but um, it was different. So Thornborough itself, there's some good news on the henges because 20 years ago, the, even the main ones, the two southern ones, uh, were threatened by gra uh, gravel extraction. So I can't remember the name of the company now, but they were seeking uh, permission to uh, uh, take gravel out of the uh, uh, the henge site itself. Threat, threat aggregate, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's now protected an English heritage uh who I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw them, actually. But anyway, I uh, purchased the uh, two southern ones a couple of years ago, and there was something in the press uh, over, oh, quite a bit, actually, over the last um, <coughs> year or so, where uh, they refused to pay the amount for the uh, northern one. But eventually they've got their uh, uh, hands in the pockets and uh, taken it over. So for the first sight, 
time in 1500 years all three are in the same ownership yeah, it's so, great. It's really exciting, isn't it? I mean, I think it's a really interesting synchronicity that it all came about whilst we were doing this as well. Yeah, uh, in yeah, the middle yeah. of our uh, recording, um, <laughs> it's a. I don't know how long they'll have to wait until the northern ones open to the public, yeah. but um, I, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, I just hope they don't make it into a theme park. But... Uh, no, I. It needs to be done tastefully. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's right. I think, uh, by the sounds of it, there's some really good local groups who are intent on not only yeah. preserving it, but also preserving it as a accessible place for people yes, to visit. Yeah. So um, yeah. that's that's really positive. So uh, you know Shannon in the um, uh, disco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She works for a guy who uh, is one of the few lime motor experts in uh, in Britain. Oh, right. Certainly in England. Um, and uh, he does a lot of work for English Heritage. So we're seeing if we can get in touch with that, uh, the, the lady mentioned in that video. I can't remember her name now, Dr. Somebody or other. Anyway. Oh, right, okay. Uh, I'll let you know if we do. <laughs> All right, good luck, yeah. Right, so we're talking about henges. So these are the other henges in the north. So the ones we've already talked about are all of these and also are below. But there's some round here, a group of three there, and a few down here. Um, <clears throat> this particular group is quite interesting, actually. So it's uh, King Arthur's Round Table, which I've spelt, spent round spell round wrong i've just noticed <laughs> <laughs> there's a little round table here it's fine. we know what you're talking about that's right and there's maybra henge here which is you can see it's the biggest of the three mm. so previously we'd seen that this is that line from our below which goes all the way up to Oakney, and we'd seen that castle rig the Devil's Arrows, or I prefer it the other way actually, the Devil's Arrows to Castle Rig, goes through Castle Dykes. In fact, it's the errors about uh, less than a mile. Mm -hmm. and it's a pretty long line, so I think that uh, speaks for itself. So the error is 0.35% of the line length. Yeah. But if we look at Maybra, we can join Maybra through Castle Dykes to Newton Kime. Now, Newton Kime, I've never had in any of... I knew it was there, but mm -hmm. I could never link it in to any, any design or anything else. So this is the first time I've been able to do that. Uh, 78 miles long, and there isn't an error. No. Dykes. <laughs> it's right through it. Spot on. <laughs> However, I can then extend that down to West Ashby. And there's also a henge at West Butterwick there. Now, it shifts the angle of the line very slightly doing that. Uh, that's 145 miles long. Uh, the error at West Butterwick is the biggest error. And you can actually see it on the, this. But even that's only 1.58%. Newton Cam is half a percent. Castle Dykes is 0.17 percent. So I think that is a pretty good line. If I'd surveyed that line with a butt flap and sandals, I'd be pretty <laughs> chuffed. <laughs> um, and and you and you had to walk it all as well. Yeah, absolutely. Know. Yeah. So this is what we've now got. It's looking interesting, isn't it? And then I can go from Maybra Henge. You remember Yarnborough Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Down to Cadby, uh, Cadby Henge, which I was at uh, last week, by the way. Uh, and the error at uh, Yarnborough is 0.36 miles. Uh, and I don't know whether that's a mistake or right, that 36%. <laughs> so, have we got a network in Britain? Uh, yeah. What's going on? 
Right, I'll leave you to think about that because we're changing the subject. So we're going to have a quick look at ast astronomical alignments. So what are the So two or more monuments or geographic features lined up and pointing to a particular astronomical event that is normally time-related? Uh, in fact, I think all astronomical events are really time-related, so mm. it's not very surprising. Um most often applies to a, the rise or the set of a specific object. And there's quite often a marker on the horizon. Uh, it can be a natural marker uh, to where the, uh, uh, the event occurs. Uh, mainly solar or lunar. So we have equinoxes, solstices. And I'd ignored them until recently, but cross quarter days, which are very close to uh, Celtic festivals, mm -hmm. so, and presumably the pre Celtic ones as well. Cause I Again, imagine. I think interrelated is the word that comes. It's all, it's all, yeah. even if it might not immediately on the surface seem related, it eventually comes back round. Um, and me and Adam have certainly been reading something where this is all very. Uh, very much part of it. Yeah. I mean, it really looks it when you start looking at this sort of thing because mm. you can see that, the, you know, it just points to these these places. Uh, as far as the moon goes, it's uh, a major or minor lunar standstill, obviously. The, the angles those point to and the uh, solstice angles change depending on the latitude. So you can't just take um, what you can see out of your window and apply it to uh, Giza, for instance. Mm. So it'll change. <laughs> And specific stars. So unless you have other information, it's almost impossible to find anything about specific stars. But you'll see that um, uh, towards the end that I'm making some uh, interesting claims on the Pleiades. So why were they built? Uh, most people think it's to measure time and you can understand that if you haven't got a clock how do you measure time so the sun can give you eight dates in the year so you've got the, uh, uh, the two equinoxes the two solstices and the uh, uh, the halfway points between those uh, the moon can give you eight uh, 12 or 13 but they're more difficult to measure so you've got to be uh, if you're using the moon, you've got to be able to track time because it changes each year. So, and uh, it's within that 18.6 year cycle that we talked about a couple of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I think it could also be possible that they used it to measure longer periods of time. So. Because stars, the uh, rise point of stars, move along the horizon uh, from a northern point to a southern point, if you can say a particular event occurred when Sirius, uh, Sirius for instance, had its northernmost rise, that would freeze that point in time and you could remember when that thing happened. And... Um, so that's similar to me claiming that the sudden rise of Aldebaran uh, in 9600 BC had some significance to them. Uh, this would require them, I mean, if you go down this list, the complexity of doing the job gets more difficult at each level. Yeah. So the sun, you can get the uh, equinox and the solstices relatively easy by watching it for three or four years the moon is a lot more difficult you've got to watch it for uh, at least 18.6 years and then hope that it's not cloudy on the night uh, <laughs> yeah. and this does require you to know that stars do move along the horizon and reach a furthest point and then come back again so this requires quite an advanced understanding of uh, astronomy. Mm -hmm. 
So how do we find uh, these particular uh, where where they uh, where they would occur on the horizon? So we can use Stellarium, uh, and it has a tool called Archeo uh, Lines, uh, which show the main movement. So here you can see that you've got the major lunar standstill, the solstice. Uh, this is the minor lunar standstill. Um, don't know what that is. That's the equinox and so on and so forth. And all of them have got writing on them so you can see what they are. And you can see where they cross the horizon. So, for instance, we've got here... Um, no, right, okay. It's the equinox. So it's 270 and 90. Um, and this is for the devil's arrow so i can pick up the angle so i know that on a particular date if i look in that direction and the sun is either rising or setting uh that that is the time in the great year sorry not in the great year in the in the year when um <coughs> uh where i am uh, if it's if the sun isn't setting or the moon isn't uh, rising on along that line, uh, I'm not at that time of the year. Mm -hmm. So getting that angle though isn't the true, uh, isn't the final say in all of this because the ancients we we assume uh, an object has risen when it just crosses the horizon. Uh, the ancients considered that it was uh, had to be you had to be able to see it basically. Yeah. So yeah. So it's a degree or maybe more above the horizon. So mm -hmm. you can imagine looking at the sun uh, on the solstice and the rise of the sun. Uh, it's going to be reasonably high before you can even be sure it's above the horizon. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. So especially if you're using a, a oh, is this more about what you're going to say? Yeah. Yeah, using a yeah, notch in the going to say using a notch yeah. in the landscape or a yeah, right, yeah. for something to rise or set against or yeah yeah yeah. So you also have to allow for local geography. So if there are hills, um, you've got to allow for the uh, al altitude of the hill. So you need to measure the the height of the hill and the distance from it and calculate the angle that will give you uh, uh, an adjustment to the height okay, so i've got, yeah. got some examples of this so uh so what you can say is that um the angle any monuments alignment points to along the horizon will always be a degree or two to the south of what is shown in Stellarium, yeah, okay. because it's risen a bit from where we think it is, and you've got to allow for the hills. So. Yeah, and this just reminds me of just the the, the sort of uh, pragmatic factor in how the ancients did things anyway, in as yeah. much as they they had the ability to to do some remarkable precision, but sometimes that when you actually get down to the bare bones, that precise point isn't the best way to do things. Yes, you know, you've right. got yeah. to allow yeah. for the practicalities, which they did yeah. very well. And I think this I mean, is, that's just another example of that. If, point. if you're using the local markers to tell you the time, you want the marker to be where the sun is on that day. You don't want it to be uh, at the actual where it would have crossed the uh, theoretical horizon. If yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they did know where that theoretical hor uh, horizon was because uh, we've seen that in on a couple of occasions. So that line from the Devil's Arrows down to South Wales, that is the theoretical line of where the sun crosses the horizon. It's not allowing for uh, the local hills around the Devil's Arrows. Yeah, so they yes. didn't know Genius. What they were, yeah. yeah, they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. So let's go back to um, Yorkshire. This, by the way, 
is uh, the sign outside uh, the Rudstone chair. <laughs> it's, really, it's quite descriptive, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're getting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So as far as I can see, the Devil's Arrows and Rudstone Monolith don't have any local astronomical alignment markers. Hmm. Uh, which I was quite surprised at when I found it, actually. Uh, certainly, um, the Devil's Arrows have uh, long-distance ones, typically that one down to uh, uh, South Wales, hmm. um, but nothing else. No. Are we getting to are we getting to the the date for Thornborough soon? Are we by? Uh, we uh, that's right at the end. But oh, right at the end. All right, okay. Not, 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 not that far away. <laughs> 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 right. So this is Thornborough, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and I've put on the uh, on the map um, the lidar of it as well, so you can see where the entrances to the hinges are. So you can see that there's an entrance there. Oh, yeah, there. yeah. Oh, that's a nice little overlay, actually. Yeah. That's nice. yeah. I could send you those if you wanted. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so these are the lines that join them. Uh, and the azimuth angles for these, uh, this one is 147.5 degrees, and the land is dropping off here. So he could actually pick up uh, the exact point of the rise of the uh, of the uh, sun or the moon. Oh right, nice. uh, but there's no sudden entrance as far as I can see. If you look at the lidar on this, I just can't see a sudden entrance. Oh, interesting. It okay, it does look as though there is an east and a western one, as well as a northern one. Mm. Uh, so the, the moon rises at 150 degrees, so I'm pretty certain that uh, there isn't a sudden um, uh, the, the, there isn't a su sudden alignment to the moon uh, coming out of Thornborough. Um, but looking north, so from here I can look north and look directly through the northern hinge. I can't do now because there's trees in the way. But I <laughs> Uh, and that line is 321.8 degrees. The land rises slightly. And if you go through all that calculation, you find out that the uh, major lunar standstill northern set is at 321.8 degrees. Now, just before we go on and look at that, what that means, I've also drawn these lines through the other uh, entrances. Uh, and it's difficult to tell because of all the erosion on the hinges. Uh, yeah. But it looks as though <coughs> uh, this might be the, uh, uh, the alignment of the major northern moon rise, uh, and this might be the uh, uh, summer solstice. Uh, it's difficult to tell, so I wouldn't okay. like to nail too much on that. Um, so, I'm in the central henge, and it's that one uh, day in the 18-point year cycle that is the northern uh, sun, uh, moon set. Uh, and I'm looking directly through the southern, uh, sorry, the northern henge. So, these are the walls of the central henge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the <coughs> southern wall of the uh, northern hinge, and this is the northern wall. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking directly through it, and the moon comes down this line, mm. and just before it sets, it appears hmm. like that. <laughs> Magic. Clever, <isn't> it? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> And um, it took me, I don't know, two or three hours to do that. So God knows how they did it in practice. <laughs> yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Right, round here, 
these are the uh, stellarium angles for all of these events, so major lunar north rise mm. all, all the way around. The blue ones are the ones that I found markers for, and the red ones I haven't. Now, you've got to remember that these sites were built 5,000 years ago, give or take a few years, and there's been a lot of changes to the land. In yeah. That. So yeah. who knows what's happened. I'll, I want to take you through a few of them, uh, particularly the ones on this side. Uh, the ones on this side, if you're interested, we'll go through them. If you're not, that's fine. Uh, first thing to say is there doesn't seem to be an equinox marker, mm -hmm. which is relatively interesting. Um, at, if you remember at the Devil's Arrows, the uh, Rudstone would be a remote. Um, equinox marker you won't be able to see it but it's there mm -hmm. uh, and so would the Amber Henge so maybe I thought for a while that maybe um, Thombra was uh, a lunar temple and um, the Devil's Arrows was a solar temple but yeah, you know it's pure speculation Mm. So let's let's have a, a look at a few of these because it's the, the first one in particular shows you the me methodology of working it out uh, and is relatively interesting anyway. So Stellarium gives uh, a rise azimuth angle of thirty six point seven three uh, for the lunar standstill, and that is the line. Okay. Now going out. Over there, there's a line of hills coming down here that drops down to normal farmland there. But you can see the line of hills comes out here, around here. And this is the uh, high point, so the high point line. So this would be the line that the, uh, the, the, the moon moves in. And you can see at one point it goes behind this hill. Yeah. So we're now looking at uh, the moon is, is is risen. It's just above the horizon at point B. Uh, so it's got an altitude of about one degree. So they'd be able to see it along that line. Mm. Uh, they wouldn't see it there, obviously, because it's just cutting the horizon. So it would have run along the horizon here. And at that point, it would be just above the line. You notice that there's an old saint's church there. Mm -hmm. right. That's the old saint's church at Ingleby Ironcliffe. Um, point B there. Uh, now, the church itself was built in 1821, but on the site of a previous older church, and probably older churches than that. Mm -hmm. And there are very old stones in there that... So, right. have been maintained within the church. So at point B then, um, or just after point B, the moon then passes beyond, behind this hill. The, the, the vertical altitude is uh, exaggerated, but it suffices. <clears throat> Gets to point C and it pops up again. Boom, I'm here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so it becomes visible, and that's at uh, the ancient settlement of Scarthwood Moor. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, megalithic.co.uk says it's a large settlement, potentially in continuous use from the Neolithic period to the Iron Age. Ooh. One of those. Right, nearby there, there are uh, a group of uh, standing stones, uh, seven stones called the Seven Sisters. Now, remember the Devil's Arrows are um, yeah. ladies and they're the Seven Sisters? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the tallest of the stones is five foot high and it's got some deep, where the grooves in it, you can't really see them on there, but uh, the others are about three foot high. Mm -hmm. Right, 
You want the sure. deep weather groups grooves keep on reappearing in the stones in the area, don't they? Yeah, they do. It's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah. are, the, are the grooves deliberate or not? I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> or, or even even if they're just selected for the grooves, you know, it's uh, yeah, yeah, interesting. So the moon continues moving, and point D is actually probably the real uh, standstill marker. So this is what it would look like. Once again, the vertical height of the hill is exaggerated, but the moon is now within that little trough there. So mm. you were talking about a trough before, Peter. Yeah, yeah. There's a typical one. Yeah, no, now, absolutely. Inter interestingly, this whole whole area is covered by these uh, cup mark stones. Yeah. Uh, and remember, I was speculating in the last episode of the episode before, about these might be some form of writing or recording. Yeah. yeah. And it would seem really appropriate that uh, I mentioned on the last slide that because the uh, the moon... Um, because throughout the year, uh, the farthest movement of the moon uh, moves further along uh, each each uh, each month. You've got to record uh, where it was last time if you want to use it as a calendar. So mm. they have to have some way of recording, and I suspect that this is, you know, you put a stone in each one of these when when that particular event has occurred, and you've got a way of recording it. Mm -hmm. I mean. That's the simplest way I can think of using it. It could be more complicated than that. I mean, even if a mark was made each time, I mean, if you a book can be destroyed if you've marked yeah. something in it. If you, I mean, astronomical stuff requires recording over long periods of time. That's as well. right. Yeah. Yep. So a stone is much, especially one that's bloody set into the ground as well. Yeah. So you, you can see how many just... of these things there are here. Oh yeah, yeah. Quite a concentration, isn't it? Yeah. So, and I'm sure there's some that we haven't found, and some that've been yeah. taken away and used in wars. Yeah. Whatever. Sure. So that was the major lunar uh, north rise, and uh, I showed that because it shows how you work it out, and it also shows some interesting features mm -hmm. uh, that point to uh, the significance of that. Though that particular uh, location was related to the Devil's Arrows and uh, Thornbrook. So the summer solstice sunrise is at 46 degrees, and here you can just see it. So uh, by the time it's got to 40 or 50 degrees, just short of 49.9, it's at 2.11 degrees. So the hill line from uh, Thornbury is 0. 0.6 degrees. Diameter of the sun is 0. 0.5. So we're looking for an altitude of the sun of about 2 degrees so that it's pretty obvious. Yeah, so, yeah. so it can be fully counted to say has, has risen. Yeah, yeah. Has risen, yeah. So 2.11 is pretty good, I think. Mm. Uh, and I've said there we get it at 49.9 degrees. So here we've got it. So looking from Thornborough, that's the uh, uh, the Stellarium figure. Mm -hmm. This this is 50 degrees up to something called Thindley Nine Stones. And this is if I draw a line across there. This is the profile that I'm getting. So this is uh, the Stellarium first rise. So the moon, sorry, the sun would rise up that slope effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and thinly nine stones marks the point where it would appear above the horizon. So this is thinly nine stones. And it looks as though there's 12 of them to me. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, most, most of these sites have less than claimed in the name. <laughs> so I think that's quite good. Both interesting numbers as well, with uh, relationships to each other as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was the summer solstice. Uh, 
this was the one that we talked about some time ago, actually, Peter. Oh, yeah. uh, so this is the uh, says it's the maximum. Uh, oh, mine alone, the maximum. Yeah. So, so this is the line from uh, Stellarium, and once again we get a profile here, goes like that, and. By the time I get to the point where I can see it's above the hill, I'm on this line here. And you'll see that there are a few markers along this line. Yeah. So I've got Friars Cross, Gallow Hill Tumuli, at the top there's Capwick uh, Long Barrow, mm -hmm. and not far from there, the Steeple Cross. So this is what it would look like so once again it's climbing that hill and this is what it would look like when it's just above there so you can see that there's it's just a, above uh it's about two diameters there so and, uh, and, and kepwick long barrow would be right under that yep it Flat, would yeah. and then these are the sites so this is gallows hill tumulus i mean steeple cross Friars Cross, which is Capwick, and mm -hmm. Capwick Long Barrow. So, you can, I mean, you can hardly make it out, out here. Oh, yeah. which is, someone's drawn around the yeah. teacher, so you can. Yeah, yeah. Right. very so, ancient things, Long Barrows, aren't they? So. Yeah, so the area is very ancient. So, yeah, um, yeah. So... This is a quote from megalithic.co.uk. Along the ridge top is one of the oldest roads in England with numerous barrows, cairns, etc. It is known as Hambleton Street or more commonly the Hambleton Drove Road. So I suspect it became a drove road, you know, in the uh, a lot more recently than it was uh, a proper road. I've walked this uh, along this ridge. It's on the. Um, I can't remember the name of the walk, but it's one of the long distance footpaths on okay. the North York Moors. And I've walked, is, it, walked is it like like the Ridgeway in as much as it's an elevated Yes it's, it goes it's, quite a long way. So so even if there isn't necessarily a set path on it, people have probably yeah. been using it for a long time That's to get right. backwards and forwards. Yeah. But... Uh, it drops off to the to the west and very gradually it drops off to the uh, east as well. Mm. So it's right along the uh, the ridge. Uh, and if you look here, there's a, a reeve system as well. Oh, right. Awesome. So could be mining. I mean, this area, the North York Moors, were very uh, used for mining. So there's... Uh, iron mining, coal mining, I think. Uh, do you know Whitby Jet? It's a black, mm, yeah, okay. black soft stone that is related to coal that was used in the 19th century to make a lot of jewellery. So it's oh, a yeah. shiny, shiny black stone. Um, so no, I think that. There's a lot going there. They sound very ancient, then. Very ancient. Yeah. So, I've, I want to include these two in the conversation because these actually relate back to other hinges. Okay, cool. Could I um, just have a quick break? Give me two you seconds. Can. Thank you. I might be out of sync here. Um, so. I've thrown the whole thing off course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've managed to break it somehow. Um, still, we can recover. We have the technology. Oh, yes. Yeah. So... Still in the wrong place. So I've seen a few of those images that Troy did for your um, Brothers of the Serpent episode. Yeah, they're uh, pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. they good. Did, did he talk to you about them beforehand, or did he just...? Uh, we had a discussion about the type of things. Why did it go there? Uh, <laughs> but 
there. Yeah, some we, lovely I, images. Let me just get this in. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sure, sure. But yeah, I'm just saying yeah. that you got some fantastic images that really, um, really captured the, the. Uh, yes, we we had we had a couple of discussions about what were going to be in the episodes. Um, I don't think Adam's seen them all, has he? But he'll have seen a couple of them. But that one from the top of... Um... There's this one on my desktop. Yeah. Can you see the desktop one, Adam? Yeah, that's oh, yeah. lovely. These dancing ladies around the Oh, place. great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they were made for you, were they? For, for your videos? Yes. Of the yeah. Circuit, yeah. yeah. Oh, great. So, yeah, and uh, there was that one that uh, I showed about the three people surveying on. Surveying, yeah, and I saw that. Oh, is there another one, one like that? Yeah. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that scrying dish one as well. Yeah, That's and the scrying cool. bit as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, very cool. Um, I can't remember who mentioned it, but uh, we were talking about how you do the astronomy in those days and someone, I don't know whether it was uh, on here or on uh, the Brothers podcast, but they were mm. saying you fill a bowl with water and just stare into it and you get the reflection of the stars mm. uh, and that that enables you to measure the distance between them if you think about it because uh, you have it on a small scale how, how, do you do it, how do you do it in the sky? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> it's not that big. <laughs> oh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So, and there is a picture of that. Which uh, have you have you got copies of them, uh, Pete? No, I don't think I do. Uh, I'll uh, I'll post them. I'll I'll. DM you them later on, and then yeah. you could put, put them in the text or something like that. Yeah, I think that, the the amazing pictures. I think. Oh yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Now these next two surprised me because um, remember we're talking about uh, alignments uh, to um, stellar events from uh, Thornborough. So Hutton Moor Henge is uh, north of Canabarn Henge, so I should have done a bigger bump, but I haven't. But this is Numwick Henge, and this is the main line down to uh, uh, the Devil's Arrows. And if you remember, there's another line that comes up here where you've got Hutton Moor, um, Canabarn, and then the Devil's Arrows. Uh, Hutton Moor, I've never in found any anything that it could be included in apart from a couple of long lines up to Catrick Henge and other places. But uh the angle from Thornborough, and this is how I found it rather than doing it the other way, mm. is uh, 131.8. Uh the high point is uh 0. 0.2 degrees so you can see there the uh, the line. Uh, mm. You wouldn't be able to see the hinge from here, but if you put a big fire on it, um, so it's on the top of this hill, if you put a big fire on there, you'd be able to see the fire because mm. uh, it's not that far. Um, so the moon would have to be at 2.88 degrees. So if you look at this, uh, the angle is... Uh, 131.8 and the moon is at 2.88 uh, degrees so that does look as though it has some significance uh, and we'll see later on that uh, it might be included uh, or oh, there's something else that gives it significance and significance to the moon as well. But mm -hmm. I don't want to get to that yet. But just remember that it's a minor lunar um, uh, rise, uh, standstill rise uh, okay. from, from Thornborough. <clears throat> and the last one I specifically wanted to talk about was this one, because this is Alderbaran and Canada. Yeah, Alderbaran's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. But the sun rises at 134 degrees. The angle to the hinge is 
point seven, uh, and the angle. So it's almost level, and you're not going to be able to see it. But once again, you light a, a fire here, you'd be able to see the fire. Um, so when it's one degree above the horizon, that's 1.5 degrees actually, it's at 135.77. So that once again looks as though uh, that line has some significance. Uh, not only that, but the line runs to Canabarn Henge and then on to All Saints Church up Kirby Hill once again. Uh, significant church name. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so, as I've said before, the Henge is featured for several things now. So it's in the sky map as Alderburn. Uh, the angle to the Devil's Arrows is the southernmost rise of Alderburn. I've not covered this yet, but it has some significance to a number encoded in it. And here it's uh, a winter solstice marker. This is the church itself. Um, there's been a settlement in Kirby Hill for over a thousand years. Uh, church possesses, according to this, many historical features, including four fragments from the 10th and 11th century of grave markers and one in complete. Um, so there they are. You can see the some beautiful carving on yeah. this. Now, this one that I find interesting yeah. because doesn't that look like those cup and yes. ring stones? Yes. I've definitely so, seen this. Um, so I think next time I'm up there, I'm going to try and visit this church and have a closer look at that one. Oh, that's stunning. Yeah. Now, if you think about it, for <clears throat> uh, Canabarn, um to be aligned to the sunrise uh, from Thornborough, you'd have to have uh, a line in the sky for this to happen from um, the central... Uh, sorry, I'm losing the track here. <laughs> <laughs> from the central star of Orion's belt mm -hmm. through Old Barn to the sun. Now, is there a time when that actually happens? Well, there, there was, and that was in 9100 BC. Now, the thing about that, though, is Anilam, which is the central star of uh, Orion's belt, never rises at that time. So if you knew that, you'd have to be a very good astronomer. Uh, I'm not saying they did know that, but um, I just find that an interesting fact. Mm. So... There are some others that I've found, but by now we must be getting fairly bored of these. So unless you really <laughs> want to look at them, uh, we can move on. What do you want to do? Go well, move on, and we'll um, we can do them another day. Or, or, or... Right. right, I want to talk, talk about numbers that might be encoded into the design. So nice. I guess you know what. Do you know what 1.618 is? It's the golden ratio. Uh, and these are all pictures of things that might be related to the golden ratio. So who discovered the golden ratio? Uh, in theory, uh, the standard model says that the Greeks discovered it. And what is it? Well, the easiest way of describing it is to think of a line which is sea long. Uh, and I can divide that line into two sections at any point along the line where I have uh, a long length and a short length MB. Right. But there is one point on the line where the ratio of B to A is the same as the ratio of A to C. Now, that sounds as though it should be two-thirds of the way along, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Now, just in passing, it's, it's supposed to be that when that ratio occurs, it's supposed to be the most pleasing way to split the line. 
and uh, in figures. So A divided by B is the same as C divided by A. And the number that gives you is 1.618, blah, 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 and it goes on forever. Or, in shorthand, 1.618. Now, that doesn't help you divide the line. So, if we do it the other way up, so B divided by A is the same as C divided by, sorry, A divided by C. That gives you a figure of 0 0.61803. Notice the figures after the decimal point? Mm hmm Yeah. Magic, isn't it? <laughs> it is. That's point, point 0.618 of the way along. So if it was uh, two-thirds of the way along, it would be 0 0.66667. Mm -hmm. So it's not so two-thirds. <clears throat> now, this thing uh, appears in lots of places in nature. So in the perfect body, it would appear like this and like this and like this and this and this. Um, this old fashioned guy seemed to know about it. What's the word? Is it, uh, is it co complex symmetry? Is that the term of it or something like that? So rather than being like a standard symmetry of something is equal to each other, there's this uh, uh, is it dynamic symmetry. I think that's the word. Yes. Yeah. Dynamic yeah. symmetry is where there's that internal relationship. Yeah. 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 I think so. So it appears in the face as well. These are all imperfect people, by the way. Okay. Mathematically, by the way, it's this. Let me just tell you some more interesting things about it. So I can make a series of numbers where I take a zero and I add a one to it and I get one. I can then take that figure there, put it on this line, and take that figure there and put it on this line. It gives me two. Take that there, move it down to there, and that there, move it down to there. It gives me three. Once again, there, 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 five. And I can repeat that. I get this string of numbers now I can hear you all screaming oh, I'm bored with this what's that got to do with the golden ratio mm. well if I divide this number here into this I get this see where that's going mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, this is right. the Fibonacci sequence of the Fibonacci series by the way and you'll see its relevance in a moment. But there is some fun numerology first. So if I divide 1 by 1.618, I get 0 0.618. If I square 1.618, I get 2.618. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> yeah. Right, the most perfect... So if you got a um, load of people in a room and showed them um, uh, pictures of rectangles, uh, you would find that they eventually would work out that they'd prefer one that's 1.618 long by one, whatever mm -hmm. the size is happen to be. Now, what I can do, though, is I can split the long length and draw a vertical line on it like this. Split that long length and draw a horizontal line. Split this long length and draw that. Yeah. Draw that, draw that, draw that. So I'm getting increasingly small um, uh, squares. Now, interestingly, these are related together by the area that's within them. Yeah. So 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34 come from this. I can then draw a curve in here, touching each of these long lengths, mm -hmm. like that, or like that. Now, is that curve, curve familiar to you? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Of course, some people extend it, I think, beyond what it should be, like they do any good idea, and I'm not sure that's right at all. <laughs> In fact, 
I think that's bollocks, but these look fairly convincing to me. <laughs> right. I think there's there's definitely use of the uh, the uh, golden ratio in Da Vinci, but I think maybe <laughs> yes, the spiral in that sense is possibly a step too far. But that's right. Yeah. Now there'll be people that watch this eventually. They'll be screaming, "What's this got to do with uh, megaliths?" <laughs> <laughs> Well, look at this line here. Why is Number Kenge there? It's not at the centre. It's not, is it, Marty? No. So, I've known for more or less when I started looking at this that Number Kenge isn't far from the golden ratio point of that line. <laughs> so, if I measure from the central devil's arrow, to the central henge, it's 54,816 feet. And to Numwick, it's 35,218. So I divide one by the other, I get 1.556. So remember, I'm looking for 1.618. Yeah. Now, if that had worked out to something like 1.595 or something, I'd have said, well, point proved. Must be right. But I considered that it wasn't right so well tried but wrong i thought mm. it's not far off but it's not as good as some of your other your other um yeah, yeah. tolerances is it so i've filed it away as an interesting little feature but then i remembered that each of the devil's arrows is an individual star and each of sombra henges is an individual star. Now, why would you measure from the middle ones if that was the case? Wouldn't you be more inclined to measure from the extreme ones? So the southern uh, stone of the Devil's Arrows to the northern hinge. Now, if I do that, the distance from the southern arrow to Numwick Henge is 35,634 feet. The distance from the Southern Arrow to the Northern Henge is 57,000 and a bit. And that gives me 1.618. Damn. The error is 15 no, feet. And the error is probably in Google rather than on the ground. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, that works in any, any unit, by the way, so I could mm -hmm. do that in Meters, I could do it in whatever I wanted. So we can be sure the Greeks were not the first to discover the gold. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was amazed when I worked that out. Yeah, that is fantastic. <laughs> now, it might also be in the hinges. These are actually quite too eroded, really, to say that this is right or wrong. But on here, you can see that the uh, the survey distance of the diameter of the outer hinge is 860 feet. And I measured the inner one to 532, which gives me 1.618. And I must admit, I did fiddle about with this a bit. So, <laughs> so it could be right, could be wrong. <laughs> right. You know what Oilea's number is? No, that's not that. one I've come across before. Yeah, 2.718. So many things decay or increase over time depending on the amount of the thing that there is at that time. So a good example is water running out from a hole in the bottom of a vase. So when the vase is full, there's a lot of pressure, it gushes out. As it mm -hmm. empties, the pressure's full uh, and the rate slows and it goes like this. So okay. You have Right, so the general form of that is x equals e to uh, t, where t is time and x is the flow rate, and e is a constant, and the constant is 2.718. Oh, weird, okay. So this applies to lots of things in real life, radioactive decay, growth of plants, compound interest. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that the shuttle heat shield wears away, loads of things. Um, right. I assume it's an an an, an average, though. No? How's that? I mean, 
how so for instance mean? like the decay i mean would you you, you wouldn't expect sure. over a certain amount of time to say for for one molecule to 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 drop off or whatever every, on on a on a moment no, no, every, it's the average over a large over a period of time yeah yeah okay yeah. so i'm just trying to get it straight in my head but still yeah yeah that, that's cool but um if but you get this constant number that's as, right if you're yeah. interested read up about it because this isn't a maths uh, no no absolutely i will sorry yeah yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> well we can discuss it on the discord if yeah you yeah that'd be great yeah yeah, remember Claro Hill? It's uh, a yeah, hill south cool. of um, uh, the Devil's Arrows that could have been bigger than Silbury Hill. Mm. Uh, this is the best picture we have of it. If you remember, someone saw yeah. it in some day or other and said it was 200 foot high. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is the best map I've got of where it is. So this is the best location I have for it. So, on that location, it's 21,293 feet from the Devil's Arrows. And if I use the same baseline, um, which is from the Southern Devil's Arrows to the Northern Henge at Thumbra, I get a figure of 2.708, where the actual number is 2.718. So that's an error of 75 feet. And remember, I've approximated where this is, so it could be more accurate than that. It could be a load of baloney. <laughs> but it's pretty near. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, this is something you wouldn't expect them to know. No. I mean, the golden ratio, you can make a, a, a reason why they know it. But this mm. is genuine maths. Works mm. in any unit of measure, by the way. So this next one's an oddity. It's also only his number. And this is really odd. <laughs> mm. So this is... Uh, it's not doing it in the same way. So we're not using the same baseline. So I'm using from the centre arrow to Canaban Henge. Uh, it's 20,136 feet. You'll see why I'm doing it from the central arrow in a minute. Uh, the distance from uh, the central arrow to the central hinge is 54,816 feet. Remember, each of these are stars. So the central arrow is a star. Mm -hmm. I can't remember its name now. In... Um, uh, uh, in the uh, Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, yeah, the Pleiades yeah. and the Central Henge is a star. Mm -hmm. So I divide them together and I get 2.722. Uh, so it's even nearer than the other one was. Now, the error is 31 feet. Now, but this line, uh, this measurement is actually in the stars. You can go to Stellarium and measure the angle between the central Pleiades star uh, and um, uh, Aldebaran uh, and the central Pleiades star and the central... Uh, Henge? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and that is the figure that pops out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How does that happen? <laughs> it's like the moon being the same diameter as the sun. Oh, it's the same apparent diameter as the yeah. sun. Right, so we're back to the normal way of calculating now. So this is pi. So there's a hinge called Tenland's hinge up here, which is actually on an alignment that runs out to a couple of hinges uh, just north of Rudstone. Um, now, Tenland's Henge is 18,474 feet. Our baseline is that. That gives me a figure of 3.122. <laughs> that's, that's pi. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit of a bigger error, but it's not bad. No. Right. Uh, now, this is odd. So I finish up with a figure of... 2,160 or 2,159. Um, 
so it could be the years in the, uh, uh, an age of the great year or it could be the lunar diameter in miles now you've got to assume the new what a mile is as we consider a mile if that's right uh, but there might be a reason to think that that is right. So the distance from the Southern Arrow to Hutton Moor Henge is 26,618. Our baseline is that. That gives me a figure when I divide it together of 21,666. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so... But remember, it might sound odd that we're doing it by the moon, but Hutton Moor Henge is a marker for the minor oh, lunar yes. yeah. yeah. Not only that, but if you remember, I draw a line up to Canabarn Henge, and if I extend it so it goes past uh, Hutton Moor, this isn't what you would consider to be an alignment. Both the Tenlands Henge and Hutton Moor are off the line. Mm. And why would that be? It's odd, because they don't make mistakes like that. Mm. However, if I draw my green line here, so that's the minor lunar standstill, this yellow circle is the figure I would need to give me uh, that 21,600, 21,060 figure. Mm. So anywhere along that uh, uh, circle would be okay to give me that answer. The only place it matches is where Hutton Moor Henge is. Mm. Right. <laughs> Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. <laughs> Amazing. So that just confirms what I've just told you. Mm. Right, let's just talk about Aldebaran and Can Can Canaban again before we go on to the age of the sites. So Canaban is Aldebaran in the star map. It also, if you take the line down to the Devil's Arrows, points to the southernmost rise of Aldebaran in 9600 BC. Um, if you position the whole thing um, correctly, you get this solstice summarised from Ripon Cathedral, and that would only occur if Aldebaran, uh, sorry, if Canaban is in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a bit of a complex thing. So Canaban is the winter sol solstice marker from Thornbra Central Henge. Mm -hmm. It has only his number encoded. So two, three and four depend on the latitude you're at. So have they selected the uh, latitude for Thornbra and the Devil's Arrows and Canaban? to reflect these things. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, but <laughs> all of those are true assessments of the position of Canaban and Aldebaran and uh, Ripon Cathedral. It could all be a big coincidence, but who knows, maybe not. Mm. Right, the finals bit is the uh, the date. So the standard model rate, uh, date range is from 3,500 to about 1,800. 1,800 <laughs> is obviously somebody who knows nothing about British history because these are the Beaker people and it wasn't built by the Beaker people. I was going to say that, that crosses the, the those dates across the entire Neolithic and the, and the <laughs> Copper Age and go into the Bronze Age. Exactly. <laughs> But the preferred standard model date is 2,800. Mm, it's a general, so general henge date, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's just use that as a way of homing in. Uh, I'll start with the woo woo alternative to begin with. Uh, right. I don't think, I don't think this is right, but there is some evidence, and it does make a neater solution. 
so if you remember the date of 9100 was encoded by that winter solstice uh, uh, sunrise uh, from Thornborough to Canabarn and Aldebaran. Uh, you probably don't remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I do. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. 9600 uh, BC is the date of the furthest uh, rise of Aldebaran, which we've talked about mm -hmm. two or three times today. Uh, and isn't that far before 9100? I suspect mm. catastrophic events at that time would be remembered at that time. So, the simplest way then to lay this out is to lay out Aldebaran and then throw uh, the line up to Thornborough as uh, the way that the, it would fall. So, you take Aldebaran and the Devil's Arrows. Uh, <coughs> that's been... Um, Sorry, Canaban and uh, the Devil's Arrows has been uh, Aldebaran and um, uh, the Pleiades and then uh, Thornborough has to fall where it is. Uh, so that would be the most simplest solution to it. Mm. And that would be the date of 9100 BC. But there is absolutely no evidence uh, that these sites could be that old. But I will point out that the Yorkshire sites are very scanty. Mm, indeed. Yeah. That's a lot, the same for a lot of Neolithic sites as well, and yeah, proposed right. Neolithic sites. Yeah. yeah. I don't think anyone's interested in them, is the problem. Uh, so, what I think is the rail build date then. So, we start off by saying the Devil's Arrows represent the Pleiades, and I think that is indisputable so the rising point of all stars tracks along the horizon and the Pleiades goes from 29 degrees to 129 degrees um, over the over half a great year and it does this so this goes back to 50,000 BC and you can see that uh, it's going north and reaches its northernmost point at about 47,000, then begins moving south, reaching its southernmost point at about 34,000, goes north again, reaching its northernmost point at about 23,000. 23,000 is the absolute depth of the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. Moving further south again, reaching that point at roughly 9,000. Mm -hmm. See that the points of these uh, vary, and that's because of the, we're, we're looking at long enough time periods to see the effects of the tilt of the Earth. Ah, right, okay. Now, our standard build date is here and that gives a line across there to roughly 90 degrees so Pleiades at this point is rising more or less at 90 degrees mm -hmm. so uh, around 2870 Pleiades has its helical rising and that is due east on the vernal equinox. Mm. Helical rising, by the way, is rising just before the sun. It doesn't have to rise in the same uh, line as the sun. It can be anywhere along the horizon. But in this case, it is in the same line as the sun. So the helical rising of the Pleiades is here. So you can see that here we're talking about Pleiades, it's 90 degrees, it's just above the horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and we're talking about, I fiddled here because I knew the date I was looking for by the time I did this picture. So 
This is the 21st of March, mm -hmm. uh, 2873, and you'll see in a moment why it's 2873, and this is the horizon down here. So that's some pretty um, important events then. I think Coming that at the same is, time. Well, a little rising. I mean, if you read anything about Egypt, you will know about the little rising. Mm. Um, yeah. Serious. Serious, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it took me ages to find out what the hell it'll rising is. <laughs> there is also an opposite to the hell it'll rising, by the way, which is the a chron a rising. Um, and in the same year, I mean, this is just basic astronomy, but in the same uh, same year, uh, at the autumn equinox, the Pleiades have their uh, uh, the opposite, which is uh, the rising of the planet above the eastern horizon at sunset. So it's oh, the opposite, yeah. opposite end of the year. The opposite it. end. So it's, okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. So if I then had a look around about this year, once again, this year, by the way, I was thinking 2,800 was probably right. Uh, and then my three o'clock voices kept nagging me again, saying, it's not right, it's 2,870. It's the only time they've ever given me a proper answer. <laughs> <laughs> they, they normally say, look at this. Mm, yeah. So I had a look around about 2,800, and this occurs on the summer solstice. This conjunction occurs on the summer solstice in 2873. And if you're watching the horizon, you would see castor eyes and pollocks, and they'd be a bit further out from where the sun is, so the rising there, but mm -hmm. they would rise. Then Jupiter would rise exactly on the yeah, ecliptic, followed by Mercury, Venus, Regulus. Uh, the moon would be... Um, almost invisible because it's a very new moon mm. and then i suspect you wouldn't see mars because it'd be lost in the sun in the sun yeah yeah but if you were a good astronomer you'd probably know that mars you know wasn't. it was there yeah 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 so this conjunction actually isn't that rare and it's really controlled by jupiter okay uh, so Jupiter has uh, is it an eleven year cycle or something like an eleven year cycle. Um but it is rare if you associate it with the summer solstice. Yeah. So this And you rare. throw in the Pleiades as well. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Same year, the Pleiades. Mm. So I believe that the complex was designed before it was built, it had to be designed before it was built, and the design yeah. date is 2873 BC. Brilliant. Convinced? Yeah, do you know what? I think I think uh, this conjunction, as you say, just with that equinoxial conjunction with, with um, the Pleiades as well, and how much the Pleiades is obviously important in this complex. Yeah. I think that's... Um... Well, I was pretty certain it was uh, to do with that helical rising of the Pleiades, but when I found this, I just thought, well, mm. that's it. That's got to be right. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I do like that. Okay, let's have a quick summary then. So... I think we've proved beyond any reasonable doubt that there is a sky map in Yorkshire. Yeah. Uh, coming from those numbers, even if it's even if pi and Oiley's number and so on is wrong, uh, they knew the golden ratio. They had a knowledge of maths that we've never ever suspected. No mm. one has suspected. Uh, the Ripon Cathedral site could be one of the oldest in England. So probably goes back to 2870 mm. BC at least. Uh, the location of the Yorkshire complex is special because it's uh, 
uh, his distance from the pole uh, and the fact that these alignments only work at 54 degrees north. Um, the monuments were part of a much wider design by the looks of it and as you were saying earlier Peter it looks as though the whole country was mapped and probably networked mm. uh, the devil's links seem to have something in common so quite what that is whether it is what we think of as the devil and whether there were devil worshippers or whether something else no. mm. maybe the devil devil was just another god who knows or a comet or, or a comet yeah yeah or anything like that yeah yeah the design date of the complex was 2873 bc and these people bloody clever yeah, <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> yeah and that's it that's oh, fantastic thank you Martin. yeah it's been a real pleasure having you do that with us yeah Absolutely. Yeah, um, I I think the thing to take away, as you say, is that these people are a lot smarter than we generally give them credit for. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that there's links all over the island, if not further over the world. Yeah. And also that this knowledge is, seems to be a continuity into, mm. into recorded history as well. Yeah. This isn't just an inaccessible prehistoric um, time that we, we can't get to grips with. There is actually physical yeah. evidence we can look I at. Mean, and... Yes. You, you actually feel, or I actually feel now, that people have been deliberately avoiding um, this, partly because they didn't know and partly because they, well, no one knows what, we've been through in this apart from people who watch this mm -hmm. uh, and there'll be plenty of people lining up to say it's absolute bollocks <laughs> uh, but some of those things you can't argue with you no. can't argue with the golden ratio you no. can't argue with the star map mm. no. and also no. I, think it, I think it's important Mark, you've provided something which other people can build on um, yes and you I mean, know that and they can't just say, oh, well, I think he got this bit completely wrong. <laughs> you yeah, know, and he I'm, I'm but at least if they've got something else to, to work from. Yeah. If, 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 if this series of uh, podcasts uh, gets someone excited enough to take this forward, I'd be really pleased. I mean, I'm 75 yeah. this year, so I'm going to drop off this mortal coin before long. So. <laughs> I need, I need someone to carry the torch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> oh, good. I, I think you've brought this sort of not mm -hmm. so well known site to the to the forefront a bit. And um, yeah, yeah, as I say, absolutely privileged to have you on here to do it. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. Well, yeah. I'd like to thank, thank you both you. for giving me the opportunity because if certainly if Peter hadn't have mentioned it to me, oh, was it September or August or whenever it was you first said, and I thought, well, well, if that's the case, I'd better look at my thoughts in order to think. <laughs> get your act together. <laughs> it took ages, but it was worth doing because every time you went back to it, you found something new. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, you know, I mean, all that stuff about St. Michael's Mount, for instance, all that's new. Yeah, no, uh, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, the church stuff, I suspect lots oh, of man. people realise that, but I'm yeah. not sure everyone has done a, a normal distribution statistical analysis. I think, yeah. Because, oh, yeah, and it's, it's, yeah. it's definitely time that we started applying those sorts of techniques to those That's things. Right. So, yeah. um, it, it, you know, it's no longer just the realm of, of, of speculators to point this out. We need to fill, follow it up with science, and, and science needs to be open to doing that as well. Yeah. Yes, precisely. Yeah, the, uh, the drama of... Um, of St. Michael and the Devil in the churches and in the landscape is very, very exciting for me. Um, and as well as the, the golden ratio, I think, you know, what you've done is made it really, yeah, allowing us to get a grasp on some really interesting elements of history which aren't known about. Um, I think we're on the brink of a bit of a cultural renaissance or are hoping for one at least and i think it's well, talking... i hope so but yeah <laughs> uh, I, I think i think 
I, I, I think, uh, well, I hope one is coming. And I think um, your your work and, and people like you who are doing work like this, um, you know, bringing together all these pieces um, is absolutely inspiring. So thanks, Martin. Right. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've enjoyed it. I've got to say that I do find these really tiring. So you might have noticed towards the end, I was beginning <laughs> to lose the track. No, it, me and Adam find the same thing. We, we, mm. we, we, it's uh, it is quite um, uses a lot of energy doing the recording. But yeah. um, but yeah. as we say, hopefully it will have some use for the future for for someone yeah. else. Um, yeah. And we can just stop talking about Neolithic people in this country as just farmers and nothing yeah. else. So, right. um. Yeah, great. Fantastic.